morning, everyone. When I find myself in the city of Detroit, I can't help but think of my dad. He grew up in Corktown, one of the oldest neighborhoods in Detroit, near the old Tiger Stadium. Like many people that were born in the wake of the Depression, he had an extremely tough childhood. When he was a young boy, his father went out for a pack of cigarettes one night and never returned. He abandoned his wife and their four young children, on Christmas Eve no less. Lots of people told my grandmother that she should put his, her children up for adoption, that she'd never be able to make it on her own. But as a nurse, she worked double shifts, and she fought to keep the family together. Of course, it wasn't easy. They, the five of them lived in a tiny, one-bedroom apartment on Porter Street. They often went to bed hungry. My dad was fiercely independent and innately stubborn. And by the time he had reached eighth grade, he had been kicked out of multiple schools. And his formal education came to a very unceremonious end. But he learned to become very resilient. And he never thought of himself as a victim. And he kept hold tight to his dream about a better life. So he took on any odd job that came his way until he was 16. And he had the opportunity to work at the Detroit News in the circulation department. It was going quite well for him until he got drafted by the Army for the Korean War. He would later say that the Army was one of the best things that ever happened to him. When he returned from Korea, he went back to his job at the Detroit News, but he went back with a newfound sense of discipline and a renewed purpose. He arrived to work early every day. He stayed late, and he welcomed every opportunity to get ahead. By his late 20s, he was ready to settle down. He proposed to my mother outside the front of Mr. Mike's Steakhouse on Woodward Avenue. My mom's a daughter of Chinese immigrants, so it's no surprise that her parents didn't approve of my Irish Catholic father. In fact, her two brothers did all they could to talk them out of getting married, warning my mom that my dad would never amount to anything. But determined to prove the world wrong, they eloped. They got married at Holy Cross Church over in Delray. Together they started a family and eventually went on to raise six children. My dad, stayed at, my dad worked at the Detroit News, hustling each and every day. He was determined to provide a better life, one that his father hadn't provided for him. My mother stayed home and took care of the six children that they had. We didn't live in the city of Detroit, but we certainly spent a lot of time in Detroit. For years, we were members of a bowling league at Garden Bowl um, next to the Majestic Theater. We ate many a meal in Mexican Village, and frequent drives, Sunday afternoon drives to the old neighborhood um, happened more and more frequently. I think to my dad it was important to stay connected to Detroit. The purpose being is that he wanted to stay connected to his roots, and he wanted his children never to forget his humbling beginnings. My dad's hard work and diligence paid off. He retired when he was only 55 years of age, and when he did so, my mom and he spent the rest of their years splitting their time between three homes. My childhood home in the uh, suburb of Huntington Woods, a uh, winter home in Florida, and a summer cottage on the lake um, in Canada. They went on to travel the world. They watched their children grow up, attend college, go on to become professionals, get married, and start families of their own. When I think about my dad, if he were still alive today, he'd be almost 80 years old. But I wonder what would have happened to him if he had born in 2008 instead of 1933. Would he have been presented with the same opportunities? Would he be able to replicate his own rags to riches story? As a futurist, I spend a lot of time thinking about the future, the future of work more specifically. And while I can't predict the future, I do identify trends and track global movement to try to understand what's the landscape in which the world will operate. When I think about the future of work, I know that there'll be several changes. Six global trends, to be more specific, are the least of the obstacles that my dad would have to overcome. His future would be much more in peril and much more daunting. The first of the trends is globalization. We hear lots of people compare the 2008-2009 global recession to the Great Depression. But in real terms, economists would tell you that they were really quite different. The suffering that took place in the 1930s is nothing, um, is much more significant than we saw happen um, in recent years. But in real terms, the loss of hope and optimism, concerns about unemployment, are probably the most stringent fears that we've experienced in our lifetime. In the wake of this recession, 200 million people 
remain unemployed worldwide. 40 million people in the developed nations are unemployed. What's different now from then, though, is that there's a greater safety net. Perhaps my dad might have fared better if he were alive today because there would be more welfare programs, more, more social programs that would keep him in, uh, in check. But I wonder, with that safety net, if he would have had the same drive. The second trend <coughs> is the workforce. If my dad were looking for a job today, he wouldn't be competing against a lot of men. He would be competing against a lot more women. In fact, some people will refer to the most recent recession as the he session, because it took a much greater toll on men than it did in women. Jobs that are dominated traditionally by men, such as construction and finance, decline much faster than jobs that are traditionally dominated by women, like healthcare and service sectors. And this trend will become more acute in the future because we see women having higher education achievement. In fact, in the country today, there are more women at the country's finest institutions than men. Places like Harvard, Columbia, and Penn, women outnumber the men. And women tend to get more degrees than men at all levels. Uh, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and PhDs. If you look outside the developed nations, you'll actually find that there are more female entrepreneurs than men. And this makes sense because there's not a traditional path for women to follow, so they have to make up their own. And micro-lending institutions are taking notice because many of them are finding that the rate of return on investment in women is much greater than on men. The third trend that my dad would have to deal with is the changing nature of work. My dad made his mark on the world by being a manual laborer. But if you look at technology in the last century, technology is changing the need for manual labor. We had first the assembly line, which increased efficiency and productivity. Some decades later, that turned into robotic automation, which replaced the need for manpower altogether. In recent years, this automation has moved into the management of information, things like call centers that have displaced workers. And as we go into the future, it's more likely that automation will replace complex interaction and jobs that require deep knowledge. Consider for a moment that you can download software to have your taxes prepared. You can uh, diagnose a medical ailment online. In fact, in some states, they're even allowing computers to conduct con dis legal discovery to reduce the cost of litigation. And this trend will happen more and more as IT starts to dominate the world. The fourth trend is a changing workplace. My father made his mark by showing up to work early, staying late, doing everything he could to take notice. But that tried and true message of being there on time, staying longer hours, being visible, isn't the key to success in the future. In fact, we're moving into a period where we're going to see great generational conflict in the workplace as different work ethics start to come together. The baby bloomers believe first to arrive, last to leave is the one who gets notice. The Gen Xers believe the first to respond. It's not about work time, but just being the first to respond on blackmail, Blackberry email. Those are the ones to get notice. And millennials, millennials believe where they work, how they work, when they work shouldn't matter as long as the work gets done. We see new and new um, forms of work paradigms emerging. If you were to look at Fortune Magazine's top 100 companies to work for, 80% of them say that 20% of the time their workers, excuse me, 20% of the time their workers work off-site. And we're seeing a new model called the results-oriented work environment that's starting to emerge. And maybe they're onto something, because as we see a race for global talent, this is exactly what might it take to attract the best and the brightest. The fifth trend is free agency. My dad worked for the Detroit News for 38 years. Every day he reminded me and my siblings that everything that we had, our home, the clothing we wore, the food that we ate, was all owed to the Detroit News. And without it, we would have been nothing. That sort of corporate loyalty is long gone. In fact, most people would tell you that corporate loyalty is for suckers. We're moving into an era of free agency, because in the absence of a company-funded pension, there's really no reason to stay. But this trend works both ways, because it allows companies to become much more nimble. They can manage relationships on the internet, and labor can become a variable cost instead of a fixed cost, allowing a company to be much more nimble. 
But this gets us to the final trend, and that's the race for talent. If talent can be managed worldwide across the internet, how will we attract talent? Where will we draw our best candidates from? Education will be critical going forward. It'll be difficult for someone like my dad, who had neither a high school or a college education to make his way in the world. We're moving into a time period where there is going to be great unemployment, but still a shortage of high-tech, high-skilled workers. Last year, Japan said that they had 80% of their jobs went unfilled because they couldn't find the caliber of talent that they needed. London reported a quarter of their jobs going unfilled for the exact same reason. By the year 2020, it's expected that 1.5 million jobs will go unfilled because they won't have candidates that have the college and advanced degrees needed to fill them. And at the same time, there will be 6 million people that lack a high school education. There will be a widening gap. And those people that are caught in the middle, people like my father, will be in severe trouble. So what does all this mean for Detroit? How are they poised to address these trends? Well, I'm quite inspired. I'm inspired to be at a TEDx event that talks about entrepreneurship, new ideas, new models that emerge. Last year, I met a woman who was interested in creating a hotel in the city of Detroit. She said there was no offering in Detroit that was uniquely Detroit, something that you would step inside and that you would know your place when you opened your eyes. I heard Bill Ford talk about the same idea when he went to go ahead and build the uh, Ford Stadium. He said he had traveled stadiums around the country, but when he went into Ford Field, he wanted people to recognize it. And that's why he kept landmarks, like the cobblestone row that led to the back of Hudson's department store. So I returned to my fundamental question. Could a young man from a broken home, being raised in the wake of an economic depression, still be able to achieve the same sort of success that my father did? Well, I'm not exactly sure I know the answer, but I'd like to believe that it comes from Detroit, he has a better chance than most. Because if you're from Detroit, it means that you're an underdog. It means that you have something to prove, that you're resilient, that you're used to failure, but you know that failure will lead you closer and closer to your end destination. It means that you have heart and spirit. When I think about the concept of being made in Detroit, I know that it means more than just a place. It's more than a state of mind. It's actually a way of life. The next time you see a sign that says made in Detroit, I hope that you'll think of people like my dad and the many others like him that have made the city so great. Thank you.